Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of Full Exposure with me, your host, Brian Kelly. Guys, I am so stoked today. This is the first episode of what we're calling Full Exposure on Location. And that is where we take the podcast out onto the road. We actually travel to our guests. We create portraits and record the podcast in a location that is, and here's the key, the location is significant to our guest. And today's guest is Bill Schwab, one of the finest photographers in the land, a great landscape photographer, great night photographer, and somebody I've known for, I don't even know how long, probably 15, 20 years, maybe. I don't know. It's been 20. Yeah, I don't know. It's been a long time. But in Bill Schwab's case, I traveled. I had the opportunity to travel to his home and the epicenter of his photography workshops in one of the most beautiful places in the world up north in Harbor Springs, Michigan. And actually, I really hope to do more of these episodes where we are, are occasionally can escape the walls of my studio from time to time and do podcasts uh, out in the world and in places that are important to people. Um, more about Bill. Bill Schwab's poetic photographs will likely be forever associated with Detroit, his hometown of Dearborn, and get this, Iceland. And um, in my opinion, he's one of the finest living photographers working today. Bill makes all of his own prints, utilizing a variety of analog and historic processes, as well as cutting-edge digital techniques to express his vision. Bill is ever curious. He's one of the first photographers to create a beautiful custom website when the internet first started. And when it started to become a thing way back in the 90s, Bill Schwab had a banging awesome website. And uh, his current website's great, too. But, man, he kind of flipped uh, photography websites. Uh, he sort of set the, set the mold. And uh, he had a lot of attention in the 90s uh, because his website was so great in the early days of the Internet. But more importantly, Bill and I have enjoyed a long and rich history. For nearly 20 years, Bill has been an influential friend that was instrumental in encouraging me in the earliest days of my shaky, naive and professional stops and starts as a photographer. And I'll be forever grateful for his generosity of his time to me, the phone calls and emails that he would uh, trade, and we'd trade back and forth. But in this conversation, Bill and I talk at length about the current state of affairs in Detroit, the dangers of the fine art world, galleries and such, bad dealers, you know. Uh, Bill's seen a lot. We also talk about how Bill has pivoted with technology over the years. And in some cases, uh, reverted back to the oldest technologies, just depending on what his interests are. We also dive into his deep love of Iceland and uh, reminisce about our first trip together there. And that spurred him to, uh, that first trip to Iceland eventually spurred him to regularly lead spectacular photography tours on the island. Now, this is pretty photo intensive about the business, but man, there's so much in here. Bill, you can tell, is just a great guy. And I really need to ask you guys to check out Bill's photographs that I put up on our episode page at fullexposurepodcast.com. Just go to fullexposurepodcast.com, click on Bill's page. Uh, he was generous enough to share with us a wide variety of his work. You'll see some of his images of Iceland, of Detroit at night, and also a, a digital color series that he's been working on that's just incredible. It's called Detroit, Where We Used to Live. And uh, you'll want to be able to see these photos uh, at certain points in our conversation. It'll certainly help bring some context to uh, the conversation. So, uh, as always, this episode is presented by Brian Kelly Photography and Film and Brian Kelly Productions. If you are embarking on any type of photography or video project, big or small, man, I'm happy to work with anyone on any size project as long as I can make it work. And uh, I'd be happy to explore what I can do for you. So yeah, let's get into this episode with Bill Schwab, the very first episode of Full Exposure on Location. And we're going to be doing more of these. And uh, But Bill was the home run, so I really know you'll enjoy this episode. Here we go. Are we rolling? I open up my uh, box water is better box here. It's yes, good water. Can. Yes. 
They uh, they drop ship me mm. a shipment twice a month. Nice. It's good stuff. It's just fun. Yeah, that's yeah, got no taste. That's great. Hey man, so uh, Bill Schwab is amazing. <laughs> You're the man. Yeah, I'm so Explain. glad you came. <laughs> <laughs> Explain for everybody. where are we, Bill? Where uh, are we? We are um, it's planet Mars. No, that <laughs> we are in Michigan. We are in the northern tip of Michigan, Emmett County, just about as far north as you can go before you have to cross into the uh, UP. Yeah, about 15 miles away from the Mackinac Bridge. Um, yeah. And how long have you been living on this property? Well, I've had the property since 1993, but I've been living here full time for a little over two years now. It, and, it uh, seemed to me like it gradually it was a little more time every year, you know. Yeah, it was, and you know, my ultimate goal was to come here, um, you know. And I was living in Detroit, dying city at the time, right? And right. So I was on this trajectory to come here, <clears throat> and then just as I was kind of ready to go, is when Detroit starts to get its second wind. Yeah. But to be honest with you, I've been living there a long time, and it's more like it's fourth or fifth wind, and we hope it keeps going. Right. You know. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I mean, love Detroit, but it's like, yeah, it's uh, it almost seems now so uh, it's growing so fast in a way that just is eliminating so many people. Like, it you is, guys not, have to have money now yeah. to do anything, and yeah. it never used to be that way. Yeah, and they're not, you know, I mean, who am I? But it just doesn't seem to be its... Um, they're so we've been down so long that the attention's being paid that I think everybody's just going for everything they can all at once rather than just um, you know rather than thinking it through you know I don't know yeah. I I hope they're happy and I and it's wonderful that the people that are there it's nice to have the young blood doing it and you know I mean I don't recognize the place when I go back now and it's oh. really good a friend of mine came last December and. I was uh, touring them around the town, and I was getting lost because when yeah. I got down to the downtown area, nothing looked the same anymore. Yeah, and it's new. And then I, well, yeah. I have, for the two years I had that studio in Corktown. Yeah, I went back, and it's been about two years since I had that. So yeah, I went back after really uh, like a year or something. I went and stayed in a hotel in Corktown because I was doing a shoot, and I literally there was new buildings everywhere. Yeah, the, uh, buildings that were roof had collapsed. It was now like right. a. Sh- bougie apartment place right, you know right. it was it's changing so exactly fast. and then ford motor company decided to put the money into the train station and that's really that is, explode that little area as well yeah that whole area is uh, so i mean detroit what i found out from doing that project i was doing um that where we used to live project you know going yeah. out into all the neighborhoods um you know it's just it's difficult it's nice to see the city really growing and doing things but the problem i have with it is that so much attention is paid on just that and the fact that it's 138 square miles of city and four or five six square miles are being worked on and yeah you know you got to know there's a lot of well i often a, say a lot of emptiness a lot of people who haven't been to detroit it's like it, it many many parts of detroit still look like some type of genocide happened and everybody left. Yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. or a war Apocalyptic, happened and what's left. Yeah. yeah, it's very yeah. disarming. Yeah, and yeah neighborhoods can't completely it's, empty. And, yeah. You know, something at one point, I think there were 35 or 40,000 buildings that needed to be torn down. And, <laughs> you know, they're at it, but it takes a long time to do that. And, yeah. And expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my well, God. tell us me more about So let's get, let, let's just reset. We've known yeah. each other since, or mid 90s, maybe. I late, think so. I can't really remember. Six, yeah. somewhere in there. I, uh, it had to be right near the beginning of all of, this yeah. as it is now, you know, because there weren't <laughs> the beginning podcasts. time. Yeah, there weren't podcasts. There weren't, um, <laughs> you know, there wasn't all this. You know, it wasn't. You know. Yeah. Well, I I had reached out to you just for for people who are listening. I I was so enthralled with your images of not just Detroit, but you were doing a lot of nocturnal imagery, and I had sort of stumbled on right n- nocturnal. Work, yeah. And work you saw me, that's just it. like you a, found me with night photography. You yeah. might have found me. I mean, would that have been early enough with the Nocturne site? You know, with Tim Baskerville. Out no, there? I think I don't even know how I found you, other than I was probably searching. And in those days, you had one of the earliest websites I ever I saw. A photographer. It was a beautiful website, even by today's standards. But it was like the the first website that I had seen that was like, wow, this photographer is doing amazing things. Thank you. And then it was the, all the. The night photography, I was experimenting around Grand Rapids and shooting night right. stuff, and I was, and then you were at a, you, you were wrapped at this gallery that was this iconic gallery, oh, right, Halstead Gallery, yeah. and I was yeah. like, this guy's rich, yeah, he has to be, <laughs> he's wrapped at a gallery, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing in my life I probably will never be, you know, I'm rich in experience, I'll say that, <laughs> right, yeah. but that's how I found you, and I was just, I reached out to you because I wanted some advice, and you wrote back, that was, was in the days, you know, where uh, there wasn't text and. Yeah, no. you know, it was we sound like a bunch of old dudes, but it wasn't that <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. 
Yeah, it was. And uh, well, and I sent an email to you, and lo and behold, I got one back, and you wrote uh, actually quite long, and I was like, wow, this is so cool. And then we just maintained this um, yeah we relationship did. over the years, and then it just got stronger and stronger as we went. Yeah. And I had various galleries in Grand Rapids, or well, actually two galleries, but one, the last one that I had, you were a, a part of, and I yeah, repped and yeah, that was wonderful. There. That was a really good thing, and I I remember driving through Iceland talking about that and being really supportive, yeah. and, you know. That's how I always remember when people say, when did the photography room open? And uh, I always think about, uh, we went to Iceland in 2001. Yeah. And then we were talking about it yeah. during that whole trip. I was right. like, I think, I, I think I'm going to go for it. I think I'm going to do yeah. it. And then... Um, yeah, you don't take very long to do things. <laughs> and I'm, I think it. I opened it in the fall of 2002. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Because I remember also uh, uh, 9-11 happened. And yeah. I remember I had like signed a loan or something like that. And I was watching the towers Fall, burn, yeah. and, uh, live. Yeah, thinking. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm not sure this is a good time to open an art gallery. <laughs> yeah. Well, Turns out there's never a good time to open an art gallery. That sometimes. would be true <laughs> unless you've got a large fortune to make into a small fortune. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and uh, I think what I loved about you all those years was you. I always felt like we could figure stuff out together, just like from the business side. Right. You had been in the business a lot longer than me. Tell me about where you started, though. You were you started in in doing editorial work and yeah. and a lot of music photography. Yeah, where, you know, where did I mean, it start, start? You know, I don't know how far back you want to go, but it was just one of these things that I got to. You know, my family was. Um, you know, I had a great grandfather that had a photo studio in Detroit, Lutke, and he had. Uh, you know, and it was always, you know, all my dad's brothers and he were all kind of rank amateurs and there were always cameras around. So, I don't know, in high school, I just got into the paper and the school paper and then just took it on from there. So, after college, you know, I went to college on a fine arts thing. I got my BFA in, uh, from Central Michigan University and I thought, you know, this is it. I got the world. And, yeah. You know, so I went out and, it, and there really wasn't a whole lot of room for me. You know, I was key lining at the Metro Times and, you know, it was a cool time in Detroit at that time too, but... um I don't know. Uh, and then I, I, I had this experience with Alan McQueenie in New York. You yeah. Know, and that, that really taught me a lot of the editorial side. And Alan McQueenie is, you know, a seminal portraitist. Yes, uh, yeah. But he was doing a guy, commercial work yeah. and major magazine work when there was tons oh, yeah. of money in, in well, both you of know, those fields. One of the things I wanted to say, you know, one of my big, you know, uh, I left New York. I went there to work for him, and I just kind of got overwhelmed by the place. And I ended up coming back to Michigan. And rather than being a little fish in a big pond, I became a big fish in a little pond. But yeah. you were talking about being in GR. But yeah. But what happened was, is I, uh, I don't know, I, um, you know, I, I, I learned all this from Alan from the editorial side, and so I just always thought that that was, I was going to be a fine artist, but I was going to be able to make my money doing editorial, and you, yeah. you found out that really, as you well know, it consumes your life. And, yeah. But that's what I did. I came, I, I went out on annual report tours with Alan, and then I learned a lot about lighting and doing what we've been doing here. And, yeah. And, um... You know, I just turned into a business in Detroit all those years. So I was an editorial photographer, and I, I ended up covering a lot for Crane Communications, yeah, and uh, Detroit Monthly, and then I started doing more regional things for Time, Fortune, Newsweek, all those things. It right. just grew out. So you become the guy. You kind of come in the stringer in that area. That's right. Like anything's happening, right? Gotta, you're already in the system and right. ready to just give you assignments. Yeah, basically. and then you, you know, as you well know, you get to know art directors, and they move on to another magazine, and then right. you're working for another thing. And I did a lot of corp. Um, Collateral editorial, uh, I'd say corporate collateral work for like um, Chrysler. I was a big client of mine, yeah. and those kind of things. And so you were in their little collateral magazines that only went out amongst all the uh, sure. But they paid money, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was the they thing. paid good money. In yeah, real good money. Yeah. You know, you'd shoot a shot for Rolling Stone for two hundred fifty bucks, and then these guys would pay a two thousand dollar day rate to <laughs> yeah. shoot, you know, yeah, the, some guy in a line. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, and I quickly found out where the real money was and. But yeah, at the same time, I was also really enamored with rock and roll. Rock and roll was my, I still, I'm a crazy music freak. And yeah. it was my conduit into that, you know, and I, I, I photographed a lot of people. Yeah, know, tell, I, me some of the, tell me some of the artists. I know that I always associate you with Patti Smith. Yeah, well, Patti was a, a, a big one for me, you know. I mean, she, just as a local kid, I was a big, she was a big hero of mine. Yeah. And, uh, and then I had another friend, um, Freddie Brooks, you know, hi, Freddie. Um, Freddie Brooks, who used to manage, not manage, he did a lot of right-hand man stuff for Fred Smith, who ended up becoming Patty's husband. Mm -hmm. And so there was that connection, and it just sort of worked out that just as Patty was coming back out of her shell after Fred died, you know, they needed some work. And through Freddie, who I, I was already doing some work for the bands that he was producing and things, um, it just 
grew, you know, it yeah. just grew into that. And so I started doing a, a few things for her. Yeah. It's an interesting relationship. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, we're not friends by any sense of the matter, but she's, she's really intense. You know, she's extremely intense to work with yeah. and around, and you really got to put on your thick skin, I think. You know? yeah. I mean, she's a wonderful person, but at the same time, she's a real professional and really... Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Chrissy Hine is another one who comes to mind. Not not for just that tough uh, well, w- woman who's going to be in charge of well, her exactly. whole look and, and, and how she's projected out into right, the world. And, and I mean, you know, in a woman working in a, you know, a ridiculously stupid man's world at that time. So yeah. there was actually, you know, I mean, he had to be, he had to be. Well, he had to be know, three times, three times big the, and noisy and exactly. loud and to get anything. Otherwise and she you just get it. run over. Yeah. And yeah. And so, so there was Patty and then I, I worked for retina for, for a while. I was a retina, um, uh, a retina affiliate with, uh, the retina photography. And so I photographed a lot of bands. I would get assignments to shoot basically everybody that came through town. And it was good for me because I was off Broadway kind of a thing. So like in a, in a market like New York or LA, a lot of people are clamoring to get at these people, but in Detroit, yeah. they're on a little more relaxed. And so I would get some really nice assignments here. You know, I shot Beastie Boys, I shot Pearl Jam, I shot just a lot of people. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's fun. A lot of them are looking at this little cabin over here. A lot of them are <laughs> stashed in slides in there now, you know, all the, yeah. the old days. You know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Yeah. a lot of stuff. It was fun. To, there were fun times. Yeah. Not real lucrative, but, you know, good to Well, do. a lot of the best gigs aren't, and yeah. that's... Uh, that's just the way it goes. just the way it goes. Yeah. Um, but during that time, were you still working on a fine art side? Were you shooting and documenting? Oh, yeah. Or when did, when did that really get going? Well, well, so you had your business, your editorial track, right. your corporate right. track. And, and I that, did well with that. It, yeah. was, it was very nice. I mean, for a while there, it was pretty lucrative, and I could do other things. And, yeah. and I was always following that. You know, I always thought that it was my means to the end, and the end was my personal vision. Right. And so at the same time, I was working on a lot of that. You know, and, uh, But the problem being is that I... Living in Detroit and working for all these magazines and working, you know, I was working, you're working, you know how it is, you're yeah. always on. And so when do you when do you work on your own personal work? It's hard to do both. Yeah. So I'd lay in bed and I'd be, you know, I was real close to the Rouge plant. And at night in Detroit, you know, it's quiet, you can hear things, but I could hear the Rouge off there. Every once in a while there'd be a slag pour and there'd be an explosion, boom, yeah. you know. And so it was close and it was omnipresent in my life. And uh I just decided, you know, I can photograph at night. That's when I can photograph. You yeah. know, I mean, I can't work during the day. I'll work at right. night. And that's when I started getting the, uh, the whole night thing. Wow, it sounds like a truck's, you know. That's where Harley, Harley went by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're, um, that's what I did. That's when I had the time to work. So I used to work all day and then I'd And go you're to bed. shooting Hasselblad for that stuff? Hasselblad, back on a, all that time. Yeah. yeah. Everything was square Hasselblad, 400 tri Yeah. And uh, I started realizing that shooting at night, that there was an infinite range of tones between black and white. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I just started to learn how to shoot at night. Like yeah. it was daylight. And it was fascinating, just like you were saying in your talk last night, is so many people see, they're not seeing things like that, you know? Right. And so it's a new way for them to see and they're very enamored by it and it, well, early on, you know, nobody, uh, I, I started, I wanted to be a, 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 basically the Ansel Adams of Grand Rapids is what I really set out to do, but <laughs> I wasn't going to shoot landscapes. I wasn't yeah. interested in yeah. shooting landscapes, yeah. but I was interested in architecture. Right. And then I was just started shooting the city at night and it got more and more fascinating to yeah. me. And in those days, it was pre-internet and websites and Instagram and all that stuff, and and when you would show and present night photograph night photos of the city, yeah, especially with our river and the lighted bridges, yeah, it blew people's minds. It like did. they were like, "This is it crazy!" Really and then, really uh, then they that was really the only work that I sold consistently was to for lobbies and the yeah. conference rooms yeah. and a uh, hotel or something like that. And but but i was just did you have the same fascination with the idea of i always call it just letting time build up on a single yeah. piece of film painting with light is what i used to yeah. call it it's just like you let it lay down on there and when your lens is open and things happen magic happens and you can start to predict that magic after yeah. a while once you've done it long but yeah that's the way it is is that you're you're building up things and you're you're able to see things and able to put things on film that people can't see with their naked eye yeah although they're there and you're it's hard for me to explain it but it's like it's like innately there. You all, 
there's just something about it when you see it. Yeah. It really resonates with yeah. you. And it still to this day does. You know, I mean, I look at some of my earlier work around Detroit and it raises the hair on my arms because it's just, yeah. it's not because they're great photographs. It's just, I remember the time of doing yeah. it, you know. They're great photographs. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's really nice for you well, to say are. that. No, but, but yeah. that's what it morphed into is that I just started yeah. doing that. And then I just had the night time to work, and then I just expanded out through the city. Yeah. And at that time, this was probably early 90s, you know, when I was doing that. And um, early 90s up into the mid-90s, I was really working. I was constantly yeah. out. And uh, it just it just became my thing. You know, you just learn. It became my, yeah. you know. And, and it was the experience of doing it, you know. I mean, here we are in the middle of the woods, right? Yeah. And this is kind of what I aspired to. But in the city at night, especially the places I was photographing, you were the only person around. So it was just like being out here. I loved right it, now. too. I, I still, when I do night photography, usually now it's an architectural client that wants me to shoot a house or the building and all lit up with the interior. Yeah. But I just love that process. There's no assistance. There's no hair and makeup. There's not a subject telling you, oh, I, I don't yeah. feel good today or... What what should I wear? And I don't. I love my day job, and I love shooting corporate work, and I love the environment of busy, noisy sets. Yeah. And oh yeah. All that stuff. But there's the solitude of just that you and a tripod Man. and an object that you're right gonna shoot and think and about. The, and the thing about it is, it's like you like. For me, it's the experience also of being out there. Yeah. You know, um, it's like it. You feel like a kid. You're exploring, yeah. and the camera puts this weird veil between you that gives you this sort of feeling of protection. Yeah. You know, like you feel like you're. Yeah. I mean, you are safe. You're out there in the middle of nowhere. It takes a long time for anybody to come to you. <laughs> you know, and if, and if you're not, you know, if you're vigilant, you're and, okay. And all those years of being downtown, that when I started in the mid '90s too, is when I first started. I think '95, '96 was when I really started to walk around with a tripod in yeah. Grand Rapids and yeah. shoot black and white film, but. Uh, there was only one situation. There's a lot of like addicts and oh, yeah. uh, you know just uh, quasi homeless people down there around, and it hasn't. It's changed a lot now. It's cleaned up, but I never felt unsafe. There was only one time I ever felt unsafe, yeah, yeah. and uh, it was yeah. just because the guy was so belligerently drunk, yeah. and uh, he was just being an ass. I never, no human ever made me feel unsafe. Um, you know, I, I had some experience with dogs down yeah. by the Ambassador <laughs> Bridge, yeah, and that that. That put a little bit of fear into me. You yeah. know, when you realize there's a lot of them and they're... And these aren't pets. No. <laughs> and they're focusing on you and starting to circle you. And yeah. Yeah. I never felt that way with, with people. I mean, I've had people throw bottles at me driving by in the car, but sure. that's just a, a reaction. They're not yeah. going to come around and do anything yeah, yeah. to you. And then, uh, you know, but I've been working on this project the last couple of years when, before I left town. I was working on that, you know, where we used to live thing. Yeah, so explain that in a little more detail. I, well, it's, they're all nocturnal images of homes. Right. And right. some of them are occupied, right? Some are occupied. And I mean, some are unoccupied. But the point is that, explain the title, because it really says what well, the whole work is used. It is started about. to just be called Detroit, where we used to live, is what I called it. Because what happened was I started to do this project, and I was posting these on Facebook every night. I'd come home, I'd pick out a couple good ones, I'd put them on Facebook. And it started to spread like wildfire, and people were always writing me saying, oh, we used to live over on the west side, or my family lived here or there. And it was nobody writing to me saying, hey, I live in Detroit. That's really yeah, whatever. It was always people that were <laughs> gone, you know? So... That's how it got that, that yeah. title. But it grew out of, Brian, the... I didn't really get to it with my earlier work around Detroit, but what I was... It was happening right around the time when Detroit was seriously dying. Yeah. I mean, it was really going, and it was a lot of ruin, and a lot of people were starting to focus on that ruin. You know, all those yeah. French guys... I can't remember their names, excuse me, but... Yeah, they, they did the big Time magazine. They did the big... Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they focused on that, and it really... You know, I knew so much of Detroit was really beautiful, and that's what I was focusing on in my night work. I was I was putting blinders on. I wasn't noticing right. everything that was falling apart around me. And I and, right. and and what it did is it really, I took it kind of personally, and I think a lot of people did is yeah. that, that that's how Detroit was being represented. And um, well, and I I started a project too there. I was just shooting people in exactly. Detroit because you were I, one of the ones. Yeah. Well, it was the anti ruin poor narrative. I was like, that was if, mine. if all if only if if photographers only pump out a decay narrative and abandonment narrative, um, the world, that's the only thing the world is going to think of Detroit. Exactly. And, it and really, that's what the world thought of it. You know, yeah. I would travel around and I'd talk to people and they'd say, oh, you're from Detroit. And they'd see yeah. an Andrew Moore photograph and they'd say, oh, that's the place where trees grow out of homes. It's sure. like, well, there's a couple of them. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. there's a lot more to it than yeah. that. And I'm not saying that uh, Detroit isn't deserving of, of the 
you know, it imploded. It definitely it, it did. Definitely, it definitely did. freaking definitely imploded. Did. It was and a it, scary place. It, it free fell uh, yeah. as hard as a city can yeah. fall. And I don't mean scary as a place that where you can get hurt, but it was just scary to see a big American city fall that hard and have. I mean, I lived there all my life, so yeah. you know, my whole life has been living in a dying city. You know, yeah. it's, and that's what that project. Yeah. One of them was fighting against that feeling. Yeah. The other one that I started 20 years later, the one, the Detroit where we used to live, came out of a shot I did at the Bablo boat at night. Yeah. And it struck me that everybody of a certain age living in this area from here to Toledo to Toronto yeah. had been on that boat. Yeah. And I was on that boat as a kid. Yeah. And that's yeah. when that, and here's this abandoned ghost ship out there, you know, yeah. and, and that's when it hit me that that's the way to photograph Detroit, yeah. you know. I couldn't have my blinders on anymore, but I could photograph it with reverence. Yeah, you know? for sure. And I'm, I, I, uh, I think what you're doing is you're. There's a huge difference between a concerned, uh, calculated project like you're doing with a narrative, and just the drive-by shootings of people exactly. roll it down and they see an imploded house exactly. that had burned and then they just put it up on Instagram. They just right. roll down the windows. And I'd see people in Detroit all the time. That's all they do. They wouldn't even get out of the car yeah, to yeah. take a photograph. They snap they, and shot. Just snap and go and yeah. post it. And, Road uh, safari. Safari shooting. Yeah, it's like gawking at a, an accident. It was. And it know, was a lot of rubbernecking. Was, to me, it was disrespectful. I mean, I love the work they, that those people did. And, and it did serve a purpose. In retrospect, I look back and it served a good purpose. But... At the time, it just didn't seem right. So that's what that project did. I mean, I had a lot of friends come to me saying, you know, we're seeing all this stuff from Detroit. You used to shoot Detroit. Why aren't you shooting Detroit anymore? Right. And it was because I just, I'd lost kind of hope. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, then this happened, and I started to get really interested in it again. And then um, I saw well, in that was photograph. a digital conver- You shot those. It was a digital. Yeah. And, you, I, and that was the time I was shifting over to digital yeah. as well. Yeah. And that was a big shift, beca- and color, Huge. because no one, no <laughs> one ever thought you would yeah. do color work necessarily, yeah. and they're amazing. They're yeah. beautiful. Huge, and I've been having fun with that stuff. It's still having a hard time getting, you know, the people that have always followed me to collect it. You know, I mean, to to look at it yeah. more. But that project, w- the, the thing about it was, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. So I had to go out there and photograph it. But I wanted to photograph it with a reverence, and and then. I spent a lot of time driving around at night. The reason I wanted to do it at night is I want it to be ghosts that I was photographing. I didn't want the current residents to be. And I, there's so much in Detroit that's come down on socioeconomic yeah. battles and yeah. racial, racial battles, battles yeah. and all kinds of things. And I didn't want to like imply, imply that this was because of any one race of people because yeah. everybody had lived there at one time or yeah. any one group of people. You know, I mean, there had been Jewish people in this neighborhood. Yeah. There had been, you know, Mexican people in this. There had been all kinds of people. So sure. I didn't want to... What I wanted was the ghosts of the past in those images. Yeah. And then what I would do is, you know, if you know Detroit and you're driving around in these abandoned neighborhoods, you'll find that there's one person that has left. They've, they've stayed, you know, yeah. and there, there's a light on in the house and, or they're keeping an impeccable lawn when everything around them has just died. It's yeah. amazing, you know, and that's what I started to see. I started to see hope in that and I started yeah. to see a reverence in that. And so I started to photograph them that way. And I started to photograph these buildings as people, as if yeah. they were portraits of them, as if they had a life. And well, maybe they had souls. The life, I, d- they I had a soul. truly believe that they do have right. this, uh, they have this patina of time and the people who occupy those buildings. So, uh, that residue yeah. is there for Well, and I just think of all the things that went on in the houses there. You know, the yeah. people that were born, the people that died, you know, the, yeah. the glorious family, you know, triumphs, and then the tragedies, and all the things that had happened in there. And it, And that became the story, you know? And... So what I was trying to portray at the same time as like giving it hope is what it was like to actually live your whole life in a city that was not getting better. You know? Right. And um, it ended up being what it was, and yeah. I loved it. And uh, it showed. Well, it, I had a big show of it in Toronto, which yeah. people came out of. It was great. It was the best show I ever had. You yeah. Know? I was at a restaurant across the street. Nobody was in the gallery, and we thought, oh, this is terrible. You know? And I sat there with a friend of mine, Dinesh, in the restaurant having a few beers, and we come out to go over to this, across the street, and the people are lined out under the street. And it was no just, a, yeah, it blew me away. That's and, amazing. But people treated it like a museum show. You know, It yeah. wasn't a kind of a thing where now people go to a gallery and they buy work. Sure. They saw this, and all of them had experience with Detroit, and all of them had been on the Bablo boat. So yeah. it really, it was the first project I'd ever done that really seemed to hit people yeah. at a gut level, you know what I mean? Well, you know, it's a shared thing. I mean, a lot of landscapes we look at are popular and all that, but they don't, you know, unless you've been there, you know, you can connect to nature and the beauty, but I think 
just to underscore what you were saying, is just the yeah that have people have an archive. They have a cache of memories that yeah. are these images re. re and that brought them out. They just rejolt. So. Oh, and the stories that I got through the internet were great. You know, yeah. if you go, they're all still in there, and you can see the comments that came from people. And yeah. you know, it was really it it really touched a nerve. You know, it yeah. it became like bigger than anything I would have ever thought it would be. You yeah, know? yeah. But, wow. you know, I'd st- I still love doing it. And Bill McGraw, who you met, he was the guy that wrote Shotgun for me, and he's a writer for the Free Press. And he, he knew the city really well, and he brought it, toge- brought it to life at night. So while we were driving the streets at night, you know, between midnight and 4 a.m., he was narrating, you know, places where significant events had happened. And, and that started to inform the photographs I was making as well, and it, it was very cool. Yeah. But we'd keep... We'd, we'd, it became like two kids playing in the woods. We we would still be doing it for no reason at all, other than you know the camera gave us a reason to drive around town at night and have fun. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. It was still probably lots of trouble still with Bill. It seems like I just met him, but he's yeah, a, he, he's a character. For we had sure. a, we had a real good time. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing I really looked up to you over the years was just your experience in galleries and the fine art world and yeah. dealing with reps and and I really. You've navigated that in such a cool way. You've shifted your business model at a time when other artists were afraid to to do that. So right. my my point is for the audience is that you know galleries were so important to photographers to show and sell their work, and these bricks and mortar places. When the internet got going, you were quick on board with that. Oh yeah, you definitely. were. I mean, I saw the potential in it right away, even yeah. when other people couldn't. It was hard to get them to ex- to understand the potential in it. And everybody obviously picked up real quick. Yeah. But uh, in the early days when I had it and people would, I would, some of my clients, uh, magazines, I'd say, well, look, you can look at my work this way. I can transmit the work to you this way. And they just, you know, one, one of them literally said, why are you even wasting your time with that? You right. Know? And yeah. then, you know, a year later, everybody's got WWW on their cars. You know? <laughs> so anyway, long yeah. story short, it got me into a lot of people's homes because I was one of the first hundred people out there with a photography website. Yeah. So, you know, you look up on Yahoo in 1995, and Bill Schwab would come up at the top of the thing, yeah. you know. That's now I'm like one of 80 million thousand of them, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, but uh, but the idea of innovating, and you sought different ways to, I think, you know, for survival, I've had areas, times I've had to shift my model just to keep food on the table and exactly. not, not yeah. going under. And that's what used to make me upset when one of the galleries would be upset with me selling my own work. It's like, yeah. you know, look, when was the last time you gave me a check? Right. Or you'd find out that they owed you for six months of photo <laughs> sales and they hadn't paid you and you're, you know, eating, right. you know, macaroni and cheese. Yeah. So that's what happens a lot in that world, unfortunately. Yeah. It's not a, there aren't many, well... It's a broad stroke. I don't. I didn't find many. I, I photographers have the same experiences. They have trouble getting paid. It's, dealers are sometimes it unscrupulous. Is. It's it's just not a world that's going to be like a good. Very few people are successful only showing work in their in galleries. Right. You know? Well, it's like trying to you know it's like being a rock and roll star or anything. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's really. You can do it, you can have a passion for it, and you can make a living, a meager living at it, but the people that are actually making a good living at it, are, you can almost count on one hand. Yeah, exactly. But there is a lot of faking it till you make it that goes on, just like a lot of in our world right yeah. now. And so, you know, just like you thought, I was rich, you know? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So, well, you thought, yeah, on paper, you're like, well, if he, I used to do the dumbest math, not just you, but just in general. Like, I saw there was a great photographer in Grand Rapids, landscape guy, David Lovers. Yeah, oh, yeah, and, I know and, David. And, and he's amazing but he had this he went to mexico and shot this whole portfolio in mexico and had this cloth box and like it was additioned out and uh it had this brochure (laughs) and just me i was like i totaled up like one okay one through ten or this price 11 through 20 or this price assuming that he sold it all yeah and i was like oh my gosh if he sells all these um you know, it's like three hundred and twenty thousand yeah. dollars or something. It was like yeah. that seemed like the hugest amount of money to me. Yeah. And then uh, I forget, like years later, uh, <laughs> he was talking about like he had sold maybe you know twelve. Yeah, of them. yeah. <laughs> you know, well, it's like, like you see things like a like a John Sexton that puts out an edition of three hundred photographs. You know, I mean, maybe John sells three hundred, <laughs> but most other guys have you know two hundred ninety nine of them yeah. in their basement afterward. I remember editioning my my first uh, my work was in. 40 or 50, 45, I think I picked, or 50, I don't remember. And the closest I ever got was like th- uh, 33 or something yeah, like that. Yeah. It was like my best-selling image. Yeah. And then yeah. um, 
you know, so yeah, when I see people do a one of a thousand or something, yeah. it's like you're not selling, you're yeah. not selling more than ten of these. Well, it was you're like I was telling it. people the other night at the thing. It's like you know, for photographers that are coming up, don't worry about that stuff. There's a lot more to worry about. You know, <laughs> become a good artist. You yeah, know? worry right. about the other stuff later because you know it's not the effort isn't going to get anything out of it. You know, I mean, it's not yeah. gonna. Yeah, and it's a strange business, you know. I mean, I hate to say that, and I don't want to discourage anybody from it, but it's not, you know, I mean, it's not what I thought it was when I was growing up. You know, I'm a working-class photographer. I didn't yeah. have wealthy parents or anything yeah. like that. And I found out that most of my heroes in photography are living on trust funds. You <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. So it's A lot of art dealers are, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they have, they have their own money that's not related to the gallery or art business right. that, that funds their hobby. Right, and, it, you know, that's all well and good, yeah. but it's yeah. hard when you think it's like a normal business world. You know, well, you that's why the, that was one of the things I found out way too quickly and way too late in the game with <laughs> f- with the photography. I remember you taking uh, going. I'm sorry, to, I didn't know all this back then. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, I would have steered you. I asked you for all this advice, and then uh, it almost killed me. Well, no, it uh, was at a time when things yeah. were hot, you know. Yeah. And I was with Halstead, and we yeah. were selling, you know, yeah. a couple hundred prints a year. You yeah, know? I mean, it was working. Yeah, yeah. And it went on for a while. Well, I remember way. going to Photo San Francisco uh, alone. You know, I, I bought a booth, or you know, you can. I was I exhibited there. Yeah. all my photographers, and you actually came I went out. You flew out with yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember, uh, I remember Kim Weston uh, and Arthur Truss across the. <laughs> yeah, we had a great time. Exactly, these legends. It was great, but at the <laughs> same time, uh, I found out that all these dealers, like they're, you know, just through through conversations or people would talk about another dealer, and I found out most of these people were were independently rich or had family money. Yeah, and I was just bootstrapping this guy from Grand Rapids out there trying to, you know, sling some prints. Yeah, around. you were and very was, much like me. And I was trying desperately to get the, my money back and not lose thousands of dollars during right. that show. And I, I did lose money on, yeah. on, on me. Well, I mean, a lot the best of, I ever did was like, whew, I uh, broke even on that. Yeah. You know? Well, it's in like, defense of it, I mean, you know, like the Halsteads who are always great with me, they would do well, but they had a lot of dead people too. You know I mean? Yeah. There was a lot of vintage photography that was sure. very famous. And, and very expensive. And very expensive. And that would carry the load. I mean, it was worth it to them for the booth. But you didn't have that at that time. And so... No, I only had, you know, contemporary schmucks like us. Yeah, but sell. you had yeah. some good people. I remember yeah, yeah. we had Ken Rosenthal. We yeah. had... Uh, Hiroshi Watanabe. Hiroshi. Um, there was a woman from the Midwest. Uh, uh, she's still... Uh, Matthew... Not Matthew. Um, I can't remember her name. You had Holly, Holly Roberts. Holly Roberts, and yeah, I mean, it was you yeah. had a good you had a good stable. No, we people. had a good stable. I mean, uh, on paper, it should have worked for sure. But I just couldn't get people in Grand Rapids to yeah, um, yeah. to collect. And you know, I mean, you didn't have the thing like with um, you know, uh, like with private dealers that are like other people that I deal with that you know they're not necessarily they don't have a brick and mortar gallery, but they have clients built up around the country, oh, yeah. and they go and visit and they bring what they yeah. you know it's like you know. There's glorified some, Tupperware some, salesman in some, a way, but yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an encyclopedia model. You yeah, know, but swing it's, over and I'll show you what I have. Yeah, and it works. I mean, because yeah. there are a lot of people that do collect, but well, not my point about Grand, Grand Rapids, my, it's not even a slam on Grand Rapids. It was just no. that the um, they really liked the images of the city. They liked to see the city. Yeah, but, you were very successful with that. Yeah, and I had a good run of just selling those and. Um, LaFonsi Galleries now actually um, holds my uh, archive. They've got an archive there now. And got so it's not digital. just gone. It's yeah. not gone, no. And I've digitized <laughs> all those negs, and so they can do print-on-demand there. Oh, good. So I don't even really have to deal with it. But the um, So it still pulls even a little revenue here and there. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, a few times a year. It bought your uh, Lamborghini <laughs> sitting over there, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Which one are you referring to? <laughs> the, the blue one. <laughs> the blue one, yeah. Uh but the so I just but they weren't uh, knowledgeable just as a wide stroke they weren't very knowledgeable about photography they right. maybe heard of Ansel Adams and that was it but yeah. then to actually possess one and hang it on the wall and maybe start collecting from a particular era or genre or a subject matter where you're like okay I'm collecting now I'm, I I want right. I'm looking for a particular types of work or a photographer's work just couldn't they that was a switch that and I couldn't flip fast enough that it just it wasn't there wasn't there it yeah. might be there now but uh, there's nobody selling photography like I was back then or at least to having a standalone well and gallery. you say that too and that was one of the things you know getting back to what you're saying about my different business model with it um you know, I started these monthly print things, and that yeah, kind of that's what I wanted to talk about. Which was like you innovated through that process, and you did a release. You'd say this is the print of the month, right? It's a you typically was like a hundred bucks, yeah, 
yeah. easy. But that's a it's a that, yeah, for most print, people 100 bucks, it's hundred bucks signed. It yeah. was a it was a um, you know I didn't audition them because they were well some of them I did uh, some I had different schemes but yeah. um, but it worked and what it did is it started to educate collectors. I mean people that weren't going to go out and spend four thousand dollars on a Harry Callahan. Yeah. You know, could buy a Bill Schwab for hundred bucks and have that appreciation and frame yeah. and to put on their wall and like it, and then, you know, and it gives you an appetite for it. Yeah. You know, I mean, like me, me and record record albums. You know, I had yeah. to buy five, ten of them a week. You know yeah. what I mean? And and there are collectors out there that are like that with photographs. Yeah. Um, you know, it is a bug. It's definitely something it, that if, if you right. get it, then and the, the more you know and learn, just about. Your vocabulary it's, 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 grows, yeah, and you and know different people. And it's and you, infinitely yeah. interesting. There's always another layer to discover. And the thing is about being a photography collector these days, too, is that you're becoming part of the whole, you know, you're becoming part of the provenance of the whole work itself. Like, you're a part of making it what it is, you know? I mean, I don't know. You know, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, um, burden a bit. I don't, I don't mean to say it that way. My terminology is not there right now, but, but it's, it's like a, uh, you know, you're part of the process by collecting that work and making that work something. You're preserving it and the other person that preserves it. And that's how things happen like in, you know, 50 years when the MoMA goes to buy a new group of work of some photographer that's been discovered. It's those people that right. that, that, that love that photographer's work that kept it and kept it in good shape. Those are the people that were part of the process of making, yeah. you know, bringing that you know, bringing that out there. So but being able to innovate, sell directly to your client base, you do an edition that was low. I mean, you would low, sell 30, great. 40, 50 of these. And, you know, if you do that math, okay, that'll cover a mortgage. It'll cover some, you know. And it worked. It, it worked. And, and it, it worked for and a while. And that was just one. Yeah, it was great. Right. And, in, in, you know, in a relationship where you've got a couple of people who are gainfully employed and bringing in money, it was fine. And, yeah. and it, you know, to this day it still is, but it's a bit of a bit more of a struggle now. Yeah. You know, and I have to innovate and do other things a little differently too. It's not all about the work; it's about tours and it's about books that I publish, yeah. that kind of thing. But, you know, in the earlier days when, like you were saying last night, you didn't have a child, didn't have all these other expenses. Yeah, it was doable, you know. But it's not doable now, and I hate to say that, yeah. you know, because here I'm about to embark on a trip to France and show my work to some galleries. Yeah. And, but I have no preconceived notions of anything happening from that. <laughs> the thick, the the skin is thick. The thin is <laughs> real. Th yeah, the skin is real thick, and my expectations. You know, I mean, I really, it's not something I need, but right. it would be nice. Yeah. And uh, you know, I just like doing what I do, and that's what's happening with photography now. Is that although it's not terribly lucrative for a lot of people, it still is an outlet for yeah. your your. Well, even the commercial uh, world rates. There's a lot of downward pressure on rates. Uh, delivering more assets for less money, uh, yeah. video it's motion, it's all, yeah. you know, it's, and there's enough people out there that will do it for scraps that uh, puts a lot of pressure and on And that's the problem is that, you know, in the Instagram age, although I love Instagram, in the Instagram age, you know, there's no surprise why when the market crashed in 2008, whatever, and, and art became, you know, went downhill and photography at the same time, there's no surprise that art you know, the, the, the more fine arts that you would think of, not photography, came back. But photography has still been languishing so much beca yeah. somewhat because in that same period of time is when iPhones and Instagram and all these things well, came about. the world's about. flooded. We, you know, we and we're flooded about, with imagery. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Marshall McLuhan never would have imagined this. You know yeah. what I mean? We're, right. we're not all TV. We're not only TV babies. We're just constantly bombarded with imagery. Yeah. And so why pick one image over another to put up on your wall? You know, yeah. I mean, that takes a little bit of education in schools. You know, yeah. we're dropping education in schools. They're pulling art out of schools. They're pulling yeah. music out of schools. It's ridiculous. It's, you know, it's they're really turning bad. us into robots, basically. And then the thing is, they're making robots that are going to make us obsolete anyway. So I don't know. More people need to be educated about art, and they're going to be better, well-rounded human and, beings. And doing and, things, you know, by hand is always a good platform, you know, when you can understand a process enough it is good and, and the then digital's good but but uh the old well, processes have their own beauty that you can't uh, yeah you and here can't. it is funny that i'm this old process guy but yet the last project i did was all digital and yeah. i'm correcting perspectives but that's you though time. you're always uh, there you know i think you have to have a lot of oars in the water you do you know? and, well just to keep it interesting to me and yeah. i don't say that you did that as a way i mean but you're interested you've always been tinkering with ideas around always. photography and even how to market yourself and how to always. you know project your your image or brand so to speak out into the world and what right. it, what does it mean you know, the quality of the work and the prints and just your right. commitment to the beauty of the work that you've done all these years in the darkroom i mean it's translating to digital as well and all that experience yeah. um 
But I wanted to talk about Iceland because you've, you there's another thing that happened <laughs> was um, in 2001, I think, you know, we were just talking about something. You're like, uh, I think I'm going to go to Iceland. Yeah. Uh, I really photo. wanted to go to Iceland. I've yeah. been studying it and I was afraid to go because, I, you know, the internet was, was, was good at that time. But there was, you know, I did a lot of research. I found out that people were mostly English speaking. But I was just like yeah. not wanting to head off into the Arctic Circle by myself. And, sure, sure. You know, so well, you were, you were kind like, enough to say, hey, I'd like to do that too. Yeah. I said, I'll go. <laughs> yeah. And so we went in 2001. And then, um, you know, since then, again, through innovation and just being a hustler, you know, I think of the Detroit yeah. hustle, you know, that's a, that's a thing is, you know, you started doing tours there and taking yeah. people over and taking photographers. It took me about and sh- four shepherd. years after that. But, I, you know, the thing about that was, as you and I went, a couple months later, I went back on my own. And then, you know, I realized that you know, I didn't want to be this photographer that, you know, and forgive me for those that you do that, but that drop into a place for a vacation and come home and make a book. You're right, know? right. I mean, yeah. there's no way you've had a relationship with that place. There's no way you can really tell us anything about that place yeah. other than you're sending us a postcard you that drove costs the ring you a lot of money. and pulled off at the same stop yeah, that everybody exactly. else does. So I just felt like I really needed to keep working yeah. it. And uh, being the uh, photographer of not many means like I am, I just decided, I said to start taking people on these trips to be able to go yeah. myself. And so I did. Well, I started you know, yeah, you did, how, you And I like social there, photography. I've probably been there a half, half dozen times before you took a tour. Before I took a tour. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was pretty well versed in the place before yeah. I took anybody. And, you know, and then people are... Uh, you know, you're guiding them. You're able yeah. to shoot a little bit. Although now I think you were saying it's it's just a lot of fun to shoot. It's just them fun to hang. Just to hang out. And I really enjoy, what I really enjoy about these trips is, you know, very often this is a trip of a lifetime for people. Yeah. And I get to go on a couple of them a year. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and, you know, I, so there's the value, right? But, yeah, I love seeing how they respond to it. It's really fun to see somebody wake up and come alive. And why Iceland? I mean, I suppose I... I uh, well, that's more of a rhetorical was, question because I, I once yeah. you've been there, it's intoxicating. But like the, I think it was the uh, the idea of it being so fresh and and you know, or this is my imagination is that it was wilderness. I mean, not wilderness, but it was solitude. It was fresh. Not a lot of people had looked at it. I mean, people had been, you know, Fred Picker, um, Stuart Clipper, and a lot of people had been up to Iceland. Yeah, uh, Linda Pond, God, tons of them. They'd been up there photographing, but it wasn't really in our vernacular yet. You know, people weren't looking yeah. at those images and thinking that's Iceland. And uh, so I saw it as a fresh place to, you know, piss on a tree. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like a place to go and work. Yeah. And and um, and that's kind of what I did. And you know, and it wasn't obviously because of me, but it really By the way, did there's grow. No, there's no trees in Iceland. There's no trees <laughs> in Iceland. So you <laughs> peed on a rock. There's a few. Yeah, I peed <laughs> on a rock. Yeah, there's a few. There's a yeah. few. But but anyway, and that was the thing is that it. It wasn't what it is now, you yeah. know, and and I fell in love with it, yeah. you know, and couldn't stop going back. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know how many trips I've done now. I, uh, I hesitate to count. Yeah. It's got to be in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. It's up there. Yeah. yeah. But it's so cool. And then that's, uh, you know, those workshops that you do in Iceland, they're travel tours slash, uh, they're maybe not a workshop workshop. It's more of a travel. Travel tour. What travel it is, tour. what I kind of build them at first. But you're helping a, people with their photography Yeah. It was well. a collective trip. Yeah. Uh, a cooperative trip, but yeah, um, I would help anybody, you know, and that, and they learned a lot, but then the thing is I learned a lot as well because a lot of the people that came were pretty good. You know I mean? Like I've had Tim Rudman, I've had Jesse Alexander, I've had some big name people with me, you know? Yeah. You know, they were really good. Did you let him drive the car really fast? Yeah. He (laughs) drove us really fast. He did the cornering. Yeah. No, Jesse was great. He's a really good guy and he's been you know, he's Jesse's a legendary. His, he is. Jesse's a legendary like uh, motorsports photographer. Yeah, and, and he's he's in his nineties now, and he came with me the first time we went on a trip with j- together. Jesse, I think, was eighty six, maybe. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and he was great. You know, he had to go drag Jesse in the van at the end of the day and yeah. stuff. And oh, that's awesome. but it was fun seeing people come alive, and that was Tim Rudman was one of those. You know, he did his book now in Iceland, and it, you know he went ended up going back many many times as yeah. well. But the first time he went, he was not enamored with it. It was really funny. And here well, I, I this. struggled in Iceland. I, I yeah. didn't, you know, I don't really, I didn't ever really get into shooting landscapes for, for you know, right. uh, part of my art. It was usually night photography, and I needed buildings and some some collision of humanity. Whether right. there wasn't people in the photos generally, but the point was, uh, and then Iceland, you know, intoxicatingly beautiful rivers and mountains and waterfalls. But, uh, and I made some very memorable photographs for myself. And yeah. we showed oh, I remember some one in Skogafoss that was really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. 
And I shot four by five and lugged that thing all over yeah. the place. Oh God! I remember <laughs> when it blew over? It blew over. Got, yeah. Smashed oh, my, smashed my. Uh, actually, didn't fortunately, it was the just lens. the filter. It was just the filter. Yeah, saved its saved yes. its ass. Yeah. But um, but anyway, yeah. That uh, but it fit perfectly your work, how you tone, how everything that you do in the dark room. Right. It, it just was. really was the, um, the perfect um. Uh, canvas sorry for that yeah metaphor for you and that became the second you know big other than Detroit that became the second big love of mine and you know I I kind of originally started off as a photographer you know with the Ansel Adams Edward Weston kind of thing in mind but those you know I love those photographs to this day but they quickly kind of became boring to me because they didn't see like I see you know I mean I see in selective focus and I see other ways and so I don't know it I'd gotten away from the landscape, and so that got me back into pure landscape shooting again. Yeah. Now, which has changed, because now I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking in Iceland for the collision of humans, because yeah. Iceland, boy, climate change, you know. Yeah. Anybody out there has got to go to the extremes of the planet to find out what's really happening. In Iceland, it's scary, because... Greenland. Greenland, you know, too, his yeah. neighbor is just like oh. billions of tons of ice you know, dropping every day. What, have I been going there now? So it's like... 15, 16 years I've been going there and there's major changes in the glaciers. I mean, miles of retreating. Re- yeah. retreating and, um, and not only that, but the plastics on the beaches. You know, there's nowhere you can yeah. go now without seeing that. And so that's kind of becoming what I'm interested in because, you know, we are damaging this place so yeah. horribly, you know. Yeah. Uh, right. And even no Iceland. About it. You know, in Iceland, too, that was the explosion. When we were going there at the beginning, there was 200,000 people a year visiting. Now there's three million people a year visiting, yeah, and they really I, haven't done anything to the infrastructure to support that. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're dam- It's we're damaging the place, and it's kind of sad to see. Yeah, well, that's that's the rub, right? You yeah. make portray something so beautifully, and people want to visit it. Yeah, and, and then Instagram, in you know. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I see all kinds of photographers going to Iceland now, like uh, on their. You know, they're not even landscape photographers, but they'll do. Yeah. The, oh, I knew the, the end was coming. I was at Gullfoss one time, you know, and there's. Yeah bus empties out, these people get out, there's this young couple, and they're struggling to take a selfie of themselves, which we now know is a selfie. Right. And I walked to him, and I said, don't you want me to shoot that? And he looked offended. He goes, no, I want to do it myself. And uh, yeah. that was that. And I thought, oh, things are changing. You know, and then you, you realize there's, like, busloads of, you know, Chinese, German people, whoever comes along, and they're, they get off the bus at some beautiful place, and they get out, and they're all dressed up, and they do pictures for their husbands or their yeah. wives, and they dance, and they never once look at what they've seen. Right, exactly. It's just crazy. Yeah. Well, I had similar experiences were in Paris and Madrid this summer. Like, you'd see people at, um, you know, at the Louvre. Yeah. And, you know, they're all cheesing and macking for the, for the, for the selfie sticks and yeah. all that stuff. And it's like, just breathe this place in yeah. for five Smell minutes. Yeah, for a minute. And just, yeah. yeah. Put that thing down. And, and we did our share of fun photos. And it's, you know, you could have taken well, a slice of me and my to. daughter Hannah. And it's like, oh, they're they're not appreciating Well, we're all so humans like, and we're yeah. part of the, what's going yeah. on now. And that's what's going on now. But... I don't know. It it's, is a strange thing. And, and that's one of the articles I read about Iceland, is that now Iceland, the tourism, is starting to fall off a bit. And uh, they, the article quite plainly said that people are off in search of new Instagrammable places. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just put a... <laughs> just end it now, man. Yeah, I know. Just bury me in this forest yeah. that we're in right now. Yeah, well, that's but, why I like being out here. You know, you yeah. kind of forget about all that shit for a while. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now you're doing workshops. So you've, you you do workshops here at your yeah at the uh, property. Yeah, and that was another thing that you did that was really cool, was a Kickstarter. Two, two Kickstarters. Two Kickstarters <laughs> to build an amazing uh, dark it's room. Really and a, cool. A whole. And I've, so how many acres do you have here now? I right? have eleven acres. Yeah. And uh, next to me, the way that you're facing is another forty acres. That's um, it's been donated to the conservancy. Yeah, and I've become the steward for it, so it's kind of like it's you your know. backyard. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not supposed to develop or do anything on right. it, but it's there, and I yeah. know, you know, if somebody's in there doing something they're not supposed to, but nobody even knows it's there. Really. Right, right. So, yeah, a lot well, of property. There's a lot around me. I um, but you were able to build through Kickstarter and your supporters yeah. uh, a, a really state of the art. Uh, workshop space it's with nice. dark room and all these different for yeah. alternative processes or old well, processes. I all processes. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hate to, you know, I mean, I know for that because of photo stock and because of, you know, my beginnings on the uh, analog photography user groups and things like that. But, you know, it's not just for that. But the thing is, is that that, that is still a major part of it because one of the things that I'm trying to keep alive as a lot of others are is the actual print, you know, I mean, the actual artwork. Yeah. We all look through radiative light. We all look at things on our phone. 
And, you know, a lot of these arts are being lost. And so a lot of us, because of that, have started to, to read, you know, have gone back. So we're doing wet play collodion. You know, we're doing processes from the beginning of photography. One of the workshops I had there this week was Mike Robinson from Toronto who taught daguerreotypes. And daguerreotypes, for any of you that know, were pretty much the first commercial photo photograph yeah. done on, on polished silver. And they were quite beautiful. So we did that. And... You know, we do gum printing, we do platinum printing, but I also, you know, I have a full digital layout in there, and I have yeah. a big 9800 printer, so I we print a lot. And a lot of what we've done now is it's more hybrid processes, so we take 19th century processes, but we use 21st century technology to be able to create our negatives and things. Yeah. So I'm able to take a, sh I can take a shot out of your iPhone, and I can make a beautiful digital negative of that and coat a piece of paper with platinum. Mm -hmm. And I can make a gorgeous print that's going to last forever out of what you just shot with your iPhone. You know? Yeah, it's amazing. And those are um, and people know, are coming from all over the country to do. They come over all the world. Yeah, it's cool. That's I've had amazing. People come from everywhere. Yeah, it's you know, build it, they'll come. It's yeah. really well. Um, it truly is. It's such an idyllic place. And uh, I I have the honor of this being the first on location podcast we've ever done, which is so cool. Yeah. So part of my dream is to take this out to other. Like I would like to just go and talk to people in places uh, that are important to them. Yeah. And to be here in this legendary property that I've heard about since the <laughs> mid '90s, and yeah. uh, we're sitting. Uh, I did some photographs at your original little cabin, the little, the cabin, little a -frame, yeah. A -frame yeah, that's where it cabin. all started. Yeah, and uh, and now you have a beautiful home on here, plus the the outbuilding with the with yeah, the, with the workshop, workshop yeah. and it's to see it grow, and it's in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Yeah, it is. I Don't mean, tell anybody though. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the more people are getting to know about it, I'm afraid it's not that. Instagrammable. It's there's a yeah, there's it's a ugly. Yeah, it's ugly. Don't yeah. come up. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's but, there's not miles of beaches and fresh water with no sharks. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but um, yeah, to just see this over the years, I just need to tell you to, for the public too is that I you gave me so much encouragement in the mid early nineties, uh, the beginning of my you, career. I really appreciate you saying answering that. emails like the, it just and I was so young and naive yeah. and a naive attempt well, that like, launched me <laughs> launched me into all kinds of uh, mischief. Well, but I'm glad it ended up this way. It ended up <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> it might have been a little scary. You know? You'd know, you come back here with the year. But I don't think I said it during the, the talk I gave last night was, you know, I don't really think I would have, uh, if you hadn't been so uh, willing to give of your time and just conversations over the years, I don't think I would have um, taken quite the same path I have. So uh, I owe you a lot. Uh, You're I somebody I've always it. respected so much uh, because, for one, you were, you'd always tell the truth. Yeah, and oh, that's always to my detriment. Sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you would tell the truth, and you would also, yeah, you would never, you just not anyone who would blow smoke just to blow smoke. Yeah. And I, uh, what's the point of that? Yeah, you got to have the real experiences, you know. <laughs> you know. Well, I'd love to uh, talk more next down the road, but um, you have to come see my studio. Too. I want, I want to come down. If you're yeah. ever downstate, yeah, which, you know, I'd love to, and I'll, you know. I'll come out of the woods sooner or later. You know, I'm I'm starting to heal now, and I'm getting yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, you're li out. pretty laid up. Yeah, leg. busted leg and stuff. Yeah. And you should tell people about, I mean, the reason Brian here was photographing is because of PhotoSoc. I have this yeah. yearly event up here for photo well, photographers. Well, exactly. So, yeah. You're on the doing, solstice. Yeah. So, it's around solstice. Yep. It's so centered around that. Yeah. And people come from all over the world. Yep. You put on... Different instructors come and teach different processes. Right. People can learn. Right. And I bring uh, in different photographers to present their work. Yep. And I try to bring a lot of different influences so that people can see that. Yeah, you and know. people can stay in this beautiful Harbor Springs greater area yeah. and uh, wander, photograph, learn some processes. It's really a cool thing. I don't know how many people were in the room last night. It must have been 60 or so. Yeah, you had probably 60 or 70 last yeah. night. Yeah. And, um, and it's just really cool. And it's just to see that, you know, again... Here you are in the middle of the woods yeah. and a magnet for photographers to come all over the world. It's fun to have them do it. I'm glad that they do. I, yeah. I'm, I'm ever grateful and, you know, I just, I'm just happy to be part of it all. You know, I'm, I'm just glad they still come, you know. It'd be, be crazy <laughs> if you put, up, put on a party and nobody showed up. But You play checkers in your, in your, um, yeah, in yeah. your big workshop. But, building. you know, I can't thank you enough for coming. I mean, I know I've tried for years to get you coming. Well, because it's yeah, a bad thing. You're I such mean, a great dad. You've invited you, me yeah. uh, many, many times to come up, and I could never do it because it's around my birthday and Father's Day and on Maddie's birthday, my yep, middle daughter. Yep, yep. And it was just tough to get away. And uh, No, it was very sweet of you but, to come, and uh, i got to say I'm, 
if it's weird to say or not, but I'm very proud of you. You know, you've done. You, it's really cool to watch. <laughs> You're my you know, photo dad. Yeah, it's really no. cool to watch you. You know how far you've gone with this. You well, know, it's thanks. amazing. It's been, but I learned a lot uh, from you and other people though about just hustle, grind. Yeah, you. It's a job when you. Uh, when something's not working out, you try something else, and you just keep going. Yeah. And if you keep falling forward, you're going to get somewhere. Yeah, even if you fall backward, you know, you learn yeah. a lot. Well, for sure. And uh, But, man, I, I, it's really cool to be here, and I, I really am uh, Thanks, appreciative Brian. you do the podcast with Thanks me. Thanks so much. It's right. really been fun. Oh, will you say one thing for me? This is brand new, too. You'll be the first guest to see this. And uh, you can look at, look at this, <laughs> this camera. Yeah, that camera. I'm you looking. You can say, uh, my name is Bill Schwab. And I've been fully exposed. Oh, cool. <laughs> My name is Bill Schwab, and I've been fully exposed. Good. Well, that was a fun conversation. I know you can tell that Bill's just a great guy. Uh, you'll have to go to his episode page at fullexposurepodcast.com. Uh, you'll see video clips of that conversation, see more of Bill. And... Um, and uh, maybe I also put uh, a couple links. Uh, one is to his beautiful website, BillSchwab.com. The other thing is you might want to go to Iceland with Bill. He's uh, filling a workshop in October of 2019. He puts together an amazing tour. Uh, it isn't really for um, amateur or like really inexperienced. You can be an amateur photographer for sure. Not saying amateurs aren't welcome. What I mean is... If you don't know too much about photography and you're just thinking you're going to go around and look at waterfalls in a van, and uh, yeah, it's not Bill's workshop. It is uh, it's filled with people from all over the world come and meet with Bill, let him take him around Iceland. Uh, he uh, knows the island land now like the back of his hand. And uh, I just promise you, if you book a trip with Bill Schwab to Iceland, it will be a trip of a lifetime. So I put up a link there. So that does it for this week. Uh, again, my thanks to Bill Schwab. Thanks for hosting me up in beautiful Harbor Springs. And um, you know what? Just go out there and get it. You know, Bill Schwab's a guy you can take some inspiration from. He's uh, pursued his dreams as a photographer since uh, way back when. And uh, he's still at it. And he's still successful. He's still having fun. He's still grinding it out. And um, for that, you know, we can all get through the week. Share this podcast, subscribe on iTunes or whatever iTunes uh, or whatever, what other podcasting app. Uh, uh, can't even talk anymore, so I'm going to get out. All right? Have a great week, everybody. See you.